So whenever you're doing an external calibration uh, curve or any type of calibration curve um, and you want to build a graph that visualizes your data and kind of helps you with these calculations, it's really helpful to do this in a um, program such as Excel, something that will let you do calculations directly in here and you can enter your data in kind of a table format and then quickly and easily do the calculations. So I'm going to be working today in, in Excel, Microsoft Excel, and um, I'm using a Mac computer. So if, if your Excel looks slightly different and you're on a Windows platform, then, then just know that that's probably why it looks a little different. Okay, But the, all the same functionality is there. You might just have to look in a slightly different place to find some of these functions. So first off, the first thing that I, I've already done here is I've Kind of given my spreadsheet a layout here. Um, I've added some text saying what's in each column. I've added the numerical values for these um, and I've included kind of my unknown data in here as well. I've also thought ahead about what kind of things I'm going to need to calculate such as the slope of the best fit line, the intercept, the R squared, um, and then I ultimately want to know what this unknown concentration is. And because that's going to be a calculated value, not an entered one, um, I haven't decided to use, just use this space up here because I want it known that this value will be a calculated one, so I've given it its own place um, down below. Now the first thing to do once you've entered all of your data in here is to build the graph itself. Now it's always helpful to have this kind of visual representation before you do your calculations to help keep you on, tra on track with what it is you're actually doing. So I'm going to go to um, insert and I'm going to pick a type of graph. Now in this case we want to do some kind of a scatter plot where our dots are just that, they are dots. We're not connecting by lines between them um, such as in this one because what we want to ultimately do is to put a best fit line over the top and if I've already connected the dots with some kind of a curved line or um, even a straight line or I don't even have dots at all it's going to be really confusing as to whether the, which line represents the best fit line and which represents simply a connection between data points. So I'm going to use a scatter plot without any additional lines. All right, so what it's given me here is just a very plain basic scatter plot. No frills, nothing fancy, um, and so all we're looking for here is, is how do we put our data in here? How do we get to represent what we want to see? So I'm going to actually right click on the chart here and I'm going to say, I'm going to select my data. Okay. Um, so when I select data, it gives me options to add multiple series. If you're going to graph multiple different curves and you want to see them kind of side by side in a way that's easy to compare slopes and intercepts between them, Graphing multiple series here is really a helpful thing, um, but since we only have one data set today, I'm only going to graph one series, so I'm going to just X those out. Now you can use, when you only have one series, this chart data range up here, and, and use this little button. It'll send you straight back to your sheet, and you can select just the data you want to be using. Now sometimes it's going to give you a problem here. Um, and sometimes it just doesn't understand where what goes on the X and what goes on the Y. So I'd like to really tell it what's going on X and what's going on Y. Um, so here I'm going to give my series a name. I'm going to say this is the Iron 2 Plus um, because that's what my example is here. And I'm going to actually go in and specifically select my desired X values and Y values. Now when I go to graph this, I know I want to put concentration on the x-axis, so I'm going to click my, I don't know if you caught that, it's this little button here that has a little arrow back to the sheet, and so now I can just click and drag across my concentration here, um, and these are going to become my x-values. Don't include your little header here, okay, we're going to use that header when we do axis titles, but that does not get included in the graphable data. Okay. I'm going to do the same thing with my Y values and get my instrument response on the Y. Okay. So now when I hit OK, now we have our data plots, our data plotted already. 
Okay. I'm going to fix up my chart just a little bit here. Um, I'm going to add a chart element and I'm going to add our axis titles. So on the horizontal or the x-axis, this is concentration and I have this listed wrong on my spreadsheet here. I have that listed as ppm. This is a molarity. So always double check your units, right? Because units are very important. And if you have it wrong in one place, you're likely to have it wrong in the other. So just keep an eye on your on your units as you go through. Concentration is molarity. Instrument response here, we're, do we're doing an electrochemical response. So now this is in millivolts. Um, I want to go ahead and add another chart. Um, axis title, we want the vertical one, and this is going to be the average instrument response in millivolts. I have to delete out those other words there. Okay. So now I have my two axis titles. Okay. When I did my axis title here, I made sure I indicated this is an average. Okay. If if it's a single value and you've only taken one, you don't include the average, obviously. But if this is representative of multiple numbers combined into one um, as an average, that needs to be made very clear. And so I always include that in my axis titles. Now let's we've it's given us a chart title here that's simply the name of the series, but that's not particularly um, descriptive, right? And I, what I see from a lot of students is they'll leave it as FE2+, plus, or they'll say average instrument response versus concentration. But I already have that information from the axis titles, the average instrument response and concentration. So I'd like something a little more descriptive. So tell me something about what I'm looking at in this figure that I don't get just from the axis titles. Okay. So we might call this something like our the electrochemical detection of iron. And now I could put this as Fe2 plus here because iron does have multiple um, forms, right? You can be iron, just iron, no charge. It can be a 2 plus cation. It could be a 3 plus cation. And I'm going to highlight just this text if it'll let me. Well, we might have to do this a different way. Um, I want to make it superscript, and it's just not going to let me here. Ah, well, it's not going to let me make it superscript. I'm just going to have to live with the fact that it's not. Okay. Sometimes its charts aren't great, and if I move it into um, Microsoft Word, sometimes it'll let me do it in Word or in PowerPoint to change it. Okay, so now we have access titles, we have the, the average data plotted, um, and now we're going to dress this up just a little bit more. Right? In order to do our calculations, we're going to need the best fit line. So I want to add a chart element, I want to add um, a trend line. Okay, it gives us a couple of options. I'm going to go with a linear trend line. To me, that looks like it's probably pretty linear as opposed to being exponential um, and we don't want to do kind of a moving average. So I'm going to just add a linear trend line. Now what I can do here too is I'd like to format this trend line just a little bit. So under the format tab here that pops up when you have your graph highlighted, um, you can actually do drop down and adjust any kind of piece of this graph. So I want to adjust this trend line just a little bit um, and I'm going to open what's called the format pane here. Okay. This gives me some additional options for the trend line. I could change the trend line even once I've put it on there to being a polynomial fit, to being an exponential fit, none of which are particularly great. We'll stick with linear. Okay. Um, I can also do set an intercept um, if I wanted to make sure that the y-axis went through a certain place that's not needed here. We want we already took a zero concentration reading so I don't need to deal with setting our intercept as something in particular. Okay. I do however want to display the equation on the chart and there's one more option here. Let me move my thing. Okay, so now you can see there's also an option to display the R squared value. So what the equation is telling us is kind of what is our slope and the slope indicates 
that sensitivity of the instrument. How much of an instrument response are we getting with a small change in concentration? The bigger the slope, the better the instrument or technique sensitivity. The intercept tells us how, um, like what kind of a background we have for our readings. We took a solvent blank measurement here, there is no analyte present, and we still get some kind of a background reading. This could be due to the solvent, this could be due to the instrument or the technique itself, just always has this baseline. And the y-intercept helps you kind of um, determine that. The r-squared is also important, um, especially when you're doing a linear fit. This tells you how uh, how linear this fit is. Does, is the data well represented by this line? The closer the dot data points lie along the line, the higher the r-squared value. The maximum r-squared you can get is a value of 1. So we're getting a value of 0.9981 and that's a really good um, strong r-squared and you can see this visually we're very linear. All our data points are falling right along this trend line. Okay. I'm just going to move this um, over just a little bit to make things easier in a minute. All right, so the next thing we want to do, because each of these y values was actually an average, what we want to do is show what kind of variation we have in that average. And that variation is described by the standard deviation of the data points that went into the average calculation. I have a column for that here, but in order to put these onto the graph in a meaningful way, we're going to use error bars. Okay, so to do this, I've highlighted um, the data points themselves. So not the best fit line, but the data points themselves. And I'm going to do chart design and add a chart element. I'm going to add some error bars, and it doesn't matter what you pick because what we're going to do is go in and change them anyway. Now, what a lot of students will do when I say add error bars that represent the standard deviation, they're going to click the standard deviation button. And I want to show you what that does here. When it does that, first off, you notice these error bars are crazy. They're everywhere. And they don't mean much, okay? What this is doing is it's taking the all of the x values that we've put here, taking the standard deviation of those five numbers and then plotting that and that's showing this spread here. So you notice it's centered kind of around our middle point and it goes out not quite reaching the whole thing. This represents one standard deviation of the x values that we have plotted. Similarly the y error bars represent one standard deviation from the y's we have plotted. None of this is particularly useful, especially when what we want to show with the error bars is what is the standard deviation of each individual data point in the y direction. So we've got to do a little bit of cleanup here too. I'm going to highlight my x error bars, and we don't have any variation in here. These are calculated specific numbers on the x-axis. They do not represent an average, so we don't need an x-axis error bar. So I'm just going to hit, I have, once they have them highlighted, um, I'm going to just go ahead and hit delete on those. So no more x-axis error bars. Now for my y-axis, I don't actually want this to represent a standard deviation. I want this to represent my calculated standard deviation, which means I need a custom uh, error bar here. And I'm going to specify the value. The positive error is going to say what is it going to be going above it and what is the, the negative error value is what's going to go below the data point. Okay. And I want to set these so that they go one standard deviation up and one standard deviation down. So when I go to select on my chart, I'm just going to click and drag over the standard deviation. Now you notice I haven't touched the unknown still, we're still only dealing with the standards. I'm going to set my negatives. And now when I hit OK, those look much more reasonable. They actually represent the variation of that data point. Now sometimes you get variation that is so small that the size of this data point, as we have it shown here, actually kind of blocks whether or not they're present. That's fine, um, and you should note that in your figure title in your report. However, for the most part, you're going to be able to see some kind of an error bar here. And you'll notice each one is a little bit different size because each one of these averages had a little bit of a different standard deviation. Okay. 
All right, our graph is good to go. Now we can move on to our calculations for the unknown. Now, you can use this directly, okay, and, and a lot of students will, but what I encourage you to do rather than you pulling these numbers off immediately is to allow Excel to do these calculations for you. And the reason I say that is while we're only showing a certain number of decimal places in this equation up here, there are many more decimal places, um, and so if you kind of eliminate those decimal places and do not use them in your calculation, you're going to end up with some kind of a rounding error. And precision here is key. So while I do do the graph and I use this equation of the line to check to make sure I've done my calculations right, I don't like to report the final value using these numbers. Okay. So let's just use Excel to calculate out the slope with additional um, additional decimal places. Okay, so in this one I'm going to use a formula called equals slope. Okay, and anytime you're using a formula then you use a parenthesis to reference data that you want this formula to apply to. Now Excel is pretty handy. It'll give you kind of pop-up help as you go. So it's going to prompt you and say now the first values you put in are your known Y values. For us we've put the average instrument response on the Y value. Then we use the comma to separate from the known X values. Okay, Now I have the known X values. I'm going to close it with a parenthesis and hit enter. And you'll notice that this number right here is the same number we've gotten as the slope of the line on the equation of the line. However, if I increase our decimal place, well, I guess we're getting only so many, but if you if you increase the decimal place and you're getting additional numeric values here, then you're going to need to make sure that you account for that um, in your graphing. We're going to do a similar calculation for the intercept, equals intercept. We're going to use our known y's, and again we're going to use our known x's. And for the r squared, we can use rsq, known y's, known x's. Okay, So I've just gotten all of the same values that I got I could get by graphing it all using Excel and ex cal function, calculation functions alone. So now when I want to calculate my unknown concentration I'm going to use cell referencing. Okay, We're solving ultimately for x and we have our known y value for our unknown here. Okay, So when we do this um, and we rearrange the equation, we're solving for x, so we need y minus b divided by m. Now, I'm going to use a calculation again, so I start with equals, and if I just take our y value here, minus the intercept, and divide by the slope, the problem here is that it's going to follow the order of operations. Um, you know, you may remember please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, right? There's an order of operations that we use when we calculate out a series of um, calculations. And in this case, Excel is going to follow that and do the division first and then subtract that value from um, our unknown. This won't give us the right answer, so in order to get it to follow the order of operations, we're going to put our parentheses around our, what we want in the numerator to then be further divided by the denominator. And I get an unknown calculation of 4.556650246. This is a little bit overkill in terms of the number of digits we want to report, so I'm just going to shrink up my digits here um, and get 4.56. Okay, That's the value that I would report. And just as a quick mental check, I'm going to go back to my graph and say if I have an unknown value of about 0.4, and I follow it over to where it meets the best fit line, um, we're getting a concentration that's um, somewhere above 4, not to 6, not even to the halfway 5 point. So yeah, a 4.56 value sounds and looks about right given our graph. So that's how you do the uh, do an external calibration calculation, solving for your unknown, and using Excel to do your calculations.